There was a shorter list of people who were after, dare one say, higher things. And uh, I suppose I, my nature made me belong to that group. And uh, I was after things like the Birmingham Rep. Amongst the parts you played, though, were Tony Lumpkin, mm. Harold in Tennyson's play of that name, and Uncle Vanya. Do you think you, you were best in? <laughs> if any, of course. Well, um, Uncle Vanya was, I played when I was 19. I think I must have shown promise and emotional content in my performance. I must have shown some emotional power, I think. And I, then into the, into the West End, I, I was just going to you, you played Stan Up in Journey's End, you played Beaugest, which were very showy star parts. Now, and it might be construed that at this time it looks as if you weren't so much interested in the classics as in being a very successful West End actor. Is there any truth in that? Um, I think I sort of knew, without, uh, and I was wanting to sound too prophetic, I think I sort of knew that I was going to climb towards something, that eventually I was going to, I thought, believed with my whole heart, right or wrong, reach some heights, and I knew that the path to such heights was a stony one. But in the meantime, I was very happy and content to be a young West End actor of a leading type, as in Beaugest, for instance, and the Circle of Chalk. I on your think. way up, you had a very splendid association with Mr. Mel Coward. Yeah. You, you, you played what's known as the other part in Private Lives. Yeah. How did you find working with Coward? Thrilling. Very inspiriting. He was terribly funny. Very witty. I think Noel probably was the first man who took hold of me and made me think. He made me use my silly little brain. He taxed me with his sharpness and shrewdness and his brilliance and his brain. And it was a point out when I was talking nonsense, which nobody else had ever done before, would make me, give me a sense of the balance of right and wrong, uh, uh, would make me read it. Never read anything. Never read anything at all. Whenever you can, indulge in a very violent physical action on stage. Can you remember when you first started that? Well, I remember first trying it. I, um, I was, of course, absolutely swept overboard by Douglas Fairbanks and uh, John Barrymore in films. And indeed, John Barrymore playing Hamlet at the Haymarket was tremendously athletic in it, you know. It was part of their glamour. That one thought of oneself idiotically skinny as I was. One liked to think of oneself as sort of Tarzan. It appealed to the girls. How do you keep yourself fit? Well, now I, I, I keep myself very fit now. I have to. I, I, I go to a gym. I go to a gym twice or three times a week. Not merely to look and get tremendous muscles, but, not, but, but um, well, I have to keep fit for my job. Uh, I'm determined to hold on to my job. I, I love it, but it is. You know, it's pretending it doesn't involve a certain amount of overwork, because it does. But I, I sort of believe that I've seen a lot of contemporaries get a bit under the weather with such work, and I'm determined not to. Coming back to 1935, you appeared in a play called The Ringmaster under your own management for the first time. Do you think you're a, a good manager? Very hard question. It wasn't actually my management. It was Gilbert Miller's management, but he made me a partner in it because I, I bought the play. But the next play I did, I did have my name over as Laurence Olivier presents. I think the... I loved it, sure, but, uh, but, but my generation's wish was to be that. It, the great ambition was to be an actor-manager to have the responsibility, in fact, to be your own boss. Simple as that. At that point in 1935 or thereabouts, did you think your career was a success or a failure? About this time, as a matter of fact, an accident happened which made a big difference to me. I, I had just got engaged by Hugh Beaumont, H.M. Tennant and Hugh Beaumont, to play in a play by Frederick Lonsdale with Edna Best. And I had obviously been thinking a lot about them higher things, you know, Shakespeare, Shakespeare. Must, it was beginning to eat at me a bit that my, my present standard of work, my present kind of work was beginning to dissatisfy me rather violently. And it only took two days of rehearsal of this play to make me give the part up. Now, it was a very unfortunate circumstance, and it always is when an actor wants to give a part up, and it has to rely greatly upon the kindness of the manager. And I said, I'm terribly sorry. I've, I've 
somehow no longer feel this is my sort of work. I don't know why I'm saying this, but I feel I ought to be playing Romeo now. Actually, I had a sort of ambition to put Romeo on myself. Unfortunately, about two days after this happened, Branson Albury sent for me and said John Gielgud wanted me to alternate with him the parts of Romeo and Mercutio. So it looked awfully as if I knew perfectly well that that was going to happen to me when I left this other play. Uh, which of those two parts did you prefer playing? Oh, Romeo. Romeo. That surprises me. I should yeah. have thought you were a natural Mercutio. Well, yes, perhaps that's why. But I saw myself as Romeo. I, 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 I was fighting a cause when I was playing Romeo because... Uh, Understand, I've admired John Gilgut all my life, com with complete devotion. I've never thought of myself as quite the same actor as he is. Quite the same sort of actor. I've, I've always thought that we were the reverses of the same coin, perhaps. I've seen, uh, as if you had a coin, <laughs> I'd seen the top half John, all spiritual, all spirituality, all beauty, all abstract things, and myself, all earth, <laughs> blood. Earth. Everything to do with Earth. Humanity, the, if you like, the baser part of humanity. I suppose I must have sensed a sort of possible rivalry between us that might last all our lives. I don't know, but I suppose it made me go for the other. Whatever it was that he had might have done that. That might have happened that way. But uh, when I was playing Romeo, I was uh, carrying a torch. I, I, I was trying to sell realism in Shakespeare. I believed in it with my whole soul. And I believed that Johnny was not doing that enough. I thought that he was uh, paying attention to the exclusion of the earth to all music, all lyricism. And uh, I was for the other side of the coin. Then in 1937, <coughs> you accepted an invitation from Tyrone de Guthrie to go to the Old Vic, and you opened with a full-length Hamlet. Now, how confident were you? It must have been an awful moment. Yes, it was. But, you know, it was all or nothing. It was just all or nothing, and so the only thing to do was to open smack out with a part that I knew I'd be very sternly criticised in. John Gilgut had proved himself to be the Hamlet of his generation, that I was putting myself up in a kind of stupid rivalry and all that. But I thought, I have to take all that, because if I don't, uh, if I don't have a bash, I'll never learn anything at all. And uh, obviously, Hamlet is a part of such enormous length and depth that you're bound to learn something through having played it. Uh, when we go over to the studio, we're going to see a scene from the film that you made after the, uh, the war of Hamlet. And it's the scene after you've been with the ghost, you come back and you make Horatio and the other two soldiers swear not to reveal what you've told them. Mm. How is my noble lord? What news, my lord? Oh, wonderful. Good, my lord, tell it. No. You will reveal it. Not heart of man. How say you then? Would heart of man once think it? But you'll be secret. Hi, my, my lord. There's ne'er a villain dwelling in all Denmark. But he's an errant knave. There needs no ghost, my lord, come from the grave to tell us this. Why, right. You are in the right. And so, without more circumstance at all, I hold it fit to be shake hands and part. You, as your business and desire, shall point you, for every man hath business and desire, such as it is. And for mine own poor part, look you, I go pray. These are but wild and whirling words, my lord. I'm sorry they offend you heartily. Yes, faith, heartily. There's no offense, but... Yes, my St. Patrick, but there is Horatio, and much offense, too. Touching this vision here, it is an honest ghost that let me tell you. For your desire to know what is between us, O oh, master, it as you may. And now, good friends, as you are friends, scholars and soldiers, give me one poor request. What is, my lord, who will? Never make known what you have seen tonight. My lord, we will not. Never, never lord. swear it. In faith, my lord. Not, not I, I, my lord, in faith. On my sword. We've sworn, my lord, already. Indeed, upon my sword, indeed. Oh, day and night, but this is wondrous strange. And therefore, as a stranger, give it welcome. There are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. But come, never, so help you mercy. How strange or odd, so ere I bear myself as I perchance hereafter shall think fit to put an antic disposition on. <laughs> 